I guess not. We'll get you there. That's okay. We'll get you there. Hey, uh, my name is Andy Black. I'm lead pastor here along with Jackie Young. We are so excited to have you all here. If this is your first time with us, welcome to the Tremont UMC. It is awesome to have you here with us today. I just want to get a few uh, things uh, started this morning. Uh, if you notice at the end of each pew, there is, I, I was told it's not charcoal gray, it's black, jet black. There is an attendance pad. I'm not good at colors. I'm just being honest. There's an attendance pad there. We want to invite you to fill that out. Let us know that you're with us this morning in worship. That's an opportunity for us to connect with you. Also on that attendance pad, you can mark if you are planning on attending our Wednesday night meal. Uh, just mark how many people from your family you plan on having attend. Uh, this week's meal, we're doing, a, a, we're doing a variety of soups and chilies, and I think we're going to even have some cheeses as well. Uh, so it's going to be a nice autumn meal this Wednesday night, and we hope you'll join us at 5.30. So please mark on your attendance pads if you plan on attending. Also want to draw your attention to our prayer request cards, which are in the back of each pew. Uh, you can fill those out if there is some way that our church staff or our church family can be praying for you, um, for somebody in your life. Um, you can let us know that. When the offering plates come around just a little later, simply drop it in the offering plate and the ushers will make sure they get to the right place. Well, today we're doing something just a little different off the top. Uh, some of you may remember the noisy offering. How many of you remember noisy offerings? Yeah. Uh, to, and, and, and traditionally, we've used that to benefit different agencies. This month, it is the Midwest Mission Distribution Center, which we've been heavily involved with lately. Uh, we want to invite the kids on down. If we've got some kids that come on down, they're going to help us take up this offering. And we've got lots of uh, cans up here that can make lots of noise. And the goal is to make a lot of noise while we collect. You guys out there, if you have any loose change, we'll take dollar bills as well. Um, we're going to collect all that, and the kids are going to come around. Kids, why don't you come on up?
church is one foundation, is Jesus Christ her Lord. She is his new creation, my water and the word. From heaven he came and sought her. Join with me in the call to worship as we read responsively. Father in heaven, may your word be established in our hearts. Establish our steps. Teach us the way to go. Incline our hearts and turn our ears to your voice. For all of us have a place in building your coming kingdom. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we are your church. We are your people. We pray that you would lead us in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves to others so that you may be glorified, lifted high. And Lord, through us, transformation would come. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love. And we pray it in your name. Amen. You may be seated.
If you would take out your GPS, I have a few announcements and opportunities to share. Coming up, uh, the Trunk or Treat is going to be Wednesday, October 25th at 6 p.m. in the church parking lot. There's a sign-up sheet in the narthex. And if you can't bring a trunk and you just want to donate candy for that night, that would be appreciated as well. Uh, Reminder that it's a combined worship on October 29th, just thinking ahead, so we all are here at the same time. And um, there will be caramel apple cider on mm. that morning. <laughs> so our fabulous baristas down the hallway. So that will be a special treat that morning. And then calling all musicians, if you have a musical gift that you're willing to share with our 11 o'clock worship service, Please see Pastor Andy about that. And then Wednesday night's meal will be chili. You already said that part. Yeah. Sorry. You all know that part. Um, so Wednesday at 9 a.m., the ladies that have been working so hard on the mats of hope would like to know if you would want to bring in a group and learn how to do that, they are going to be here at Wednesday, Wednesday morning at 9 a.m. in the Family Life Center if you want to learn how to do that. And then Pray and Play Volleyball is coming up. That will, that will start in a couple weeks on Monday at 6.30. As we move into our time of offering, I want to thank you for however you give to the life of the church. That's what makes ministry happen. And I would ask the ushers to move among us now.
Pray with me. As we offer our gifts and lives in this moment, may we become imitators of you, our ever gracious God, who holds nothing back from us. You are forever generous and gracious with all that is yours. Receive these gifts, tithes, and love offerings. Bless the gift as well as the giver, and multiply them for the growth of your kingdom. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please join me in the affirmation of faith. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. may be seated. As we go to prayer this morning as the body of Christ, uh, we do have a prayer request that's come in for uh, John and Pam Wibben's uh, great nephew who is on the Eisenhower uh, Navy ship in the Middle East. And of course, many of you are aware of the uh, escalating tensions and violence over in Israel and Palestine. So 
Um, let this be a prayer for, for their great nephew, but also a uh, prayer as well for all servicemen and women um, who are in the middle of that situation. Um, in your GPS on the inside flap, you'll notice there are names there of folks that are on our hearts during this season. You may not know every name on this list, but the good news is that our God does. He is intimately familiar with everything that's going on in our lives. There's nothing hidden from him. And so when we come to prayer, it's an opportunity for us to lift before the throne of God the concerns of this body. And so as we go to prayer today, I would invite you to look over that list, uh, maybe pick out a name, maybe two, that you would lift up before the Lord. And with that in mind, would you go to the Lord with me in prayer? Lord Jesus, we are a grateful people because when you look at us, you look at us through the eyes of love. You see us through the lens of, of grace and mercy, and we are so, so grateful for that. Lord, that rather than see people who are in disarray, instead you see brothers and sisters who you have called by name into your presence to accomplish your work. Today, in this moment, Lord, our work is to lift up those who are in need of your touch. For some, that is a touch of healing. For others, it is a, a cry for peace. For others, it is the command to be still when anxiety is raging all about them. Still for others, it is the gentle plea that you would come and be near them when they feel as though they are all alone. We are so grateful that you have called us to be your church because the church is a reminder, Lord, that we are never alone. We will never walk alone. You will always be by our side and we will have each other to draw strength and encouragement from. And today, Lord, we pray that that encouragement would be given to those who are feeling discouraged, those who are feeling disgruntled, maybe those who are suffering from neglect, those who are facing illnesses, those who are battling cancer and other diseases, those who are suffering from poor health. And yes, Lord, even for those who are in the midst of conflict. And Lord, it is with those in mind that we lift up the men and women of the armed forces here in the United States and abroad, those who are protecting our national welfare, who are putting others ahead of themselves, and Lord, who are living a life of, of sacrifice. Lord, we thank you for their courage. And Lord, we ask that you would go and be with them wherever they are, whether it's at home or whether it's far away, halfway around the world. Lord, we pray that your peace would prevail on our earth. Peace over violence, peace over hatred. Lord, peace and stillness wherever there's tension. Lord, we thank you for being with us in this place, for always being more ready to hear from us than we are to speak to you. And we join now in the prayer that your son taught his disciples to pray, praying in faith. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture today comes from Ezra 1, verses 1 through 4, and I'm reading from the New International Version. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart 
of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and also put it in writing. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Any of his people among you may go up to Jerusalem in Judah and build the temple of the Lord. The God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem, and may their God be with them. And in any locality where survivors may now be living, the people are to provide them with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. These are the words of God. If you believe they are true, say amen. 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 Sir Alex Ferguson is the legendary former manager of Manchester United Football Club. That's soccer to you who live in central Illinois, by the way. During his 26 years with United, Ferguson won 38 trophies, including 13 Premier League titles, two UEFA Champions League titles, and five FA Cups. In the cutthroat world of coaching, where the average lifespan of a soccer manager is just 18 months, Sir Alex was an extraordinary success. That means he won a lot. People like to talk about Alex Ferguson. They like to talk about his victories, and there's good reason for that. They make for great storytelling. The comebacks, the last-minute goals... In historic finals, they're memorable. The David Beckham years were particularly fantastic in that regard. But in the years since his retirement, Ferguson has spent a lot of time talking more about his failures than his successes. Sir Alex believes that he learned more about being a manager from studying his losses than he ever did from looking at his wins. And the reason, he says, is that losing galvanized him. A loss on Sunday made him a better manager on Monday. It forced him to confront his mistakes. It's a paradox, but losing did more to build Alex Ferguson into a winner than winning ever did. Well, today we're launching a new series of messages from Ezra and Nehemiah called Built to Last. The focus for the next three weeks will be upon us as a church looking ahead to God's future to us. And folks, that can be really exciting. Because I don't know about you, but I really believe in my heart of hearts that God has a great future in mind for us at TUMC. But we're going to look to that future through a decidedly Alex Fergusonian method. Over the next three weeks, we're going to use failure rather than success as a teacher. And we're doing that because the story of Ezra and Nehemiah is actually not a story about resounding success. It is a story about failure. Folks, I hate to deflate you in the first, like, five minutes of the first message of the series, but i got to tell you this. The wheels are going to come off of this thing before the end. And that's okay. If you look in your table of contents in your Bible, you're going to notice that Ezra and Nehemiah are divided into two separate books. But that, I want to let you know, is a relatively modern innovation. You see, the Hebrew Bible treats this as one book that tells the same essential story over the course of about 60 years. And contrary to what most people think, this is not a story with a happy ending. It is about God's people being divinely inspired to fulfill God's vision of a new Jerusalem and a new temple, coming together under strong and principled leadership, and then, get this, ultimately falling short of that vision. Yep, the story is going to end in failure, which is a real downer, right? But it's also reflective of real life, isn't it? 
Because as the church, we can empathize with those struggles. We understand what it feels like, on one hand, to be inspired by a vision of what could be. If you are a part of the church today, there is a reason you are a part of this church. There is something that inspires you to be a part of this community. But on the other hand, we all understand that there are places where the work of Jesus remains incomplete, right? We haven't, as a church, crossed the finish line. We haven't arrived, so to speak. Our mission as the church is yet to be fulfilled. And so as much as we experience inspiration, we also experience this frustration, this incompleteness. And I want you to know that if you're experiencing that tension in your life, it is okay. It is part of the process of becoming the people that we are called to be in Jesus Christ. So I want you to know that if you feel frustration, if you feel the incompleteness, you're in good company. That was very much the experience of the people of Judah in the aftermath of the Babylonian exile. The, the story of Ezra and Nehemiah takes place post-exile. So the people of Judah have been living in Babylon for 70 years. They lost their homeland. Jerusalem was besieged. The temple was destroyed. All the fancy furnishings and fixtures, the gold and silver, had been taken away into Babylon, and they were led away as slaves into a land that was not their own. And then at the end of those 70 years of living in a foreign land, they were able to return home. And you can imagine what that would feel like. You could experience the, the hope of a restored Israel. But the fact is, in the midst of that joy, there was also a mix of disappointment. On one hand, there was joy because this was the people of God returning to the city of God, to Jerusalem, to the temple, to the home of God, but there was disappointment in that things weren't the way they used to be. Have you all ever experienced that before? Did you all ever grow up in a town where you, you spent most of your childhood, you, you moved away and you came back and you noticed things just aren't the same. The corner store, the, the grocery store that was owned by Mr. Smith, it's not there anymore. It's been turned into an auto body. Or worse yet, it's been torn down and neglected. And that was the experience of, of the Jews returning home to Jerusalem. Things weren't the way they, they used to be. It was the same land, it was the same geography, but things had changed. The culture had shifted. People had lost their zeal for the Lord. The grand festivals were all gone. The temple, oh my goodness, the temple was in ruins. People's hearts were breaking when they returned home. Injustice and exploitation were commonplace. Jerusalem and its people badly, badly needed reform. And the storyline of Ezra and Nehemiah goes like this, that despite the best efforts of three extraordinary leaders, Zerubbabel, you can laugh, it's a funny name, Ezra and Nehemiah, those reforms would ultimately come up short. So here's a question, why are we using failure as the basis for a sermon series about building up the church? I'll tell you why, it's to make our job as preachers a little bit harder, right? No, it's because failure is part of our experience as human beings. How many of you have experienced failure in your life before? All of us. But I want you to also, as you're grasping your failure, I also want you to look for hope. Because here's what I believe, in the rubble of failure lay the seeds of success. In the rubble of failure lay the seeds of success. And I believe that the seeds of Jesus and his coming redemption are there to be found in Ezra and Nehemiah if we look for them. So before we throw the baby out with the bathwater and say we don't want to do this sermon series, we don't want to hear what Pastor Andy has to say, let's keep in mind that there were still some good things happening. There were some good ingredients in this pot. God was still working. God was still fulfilling those famous words that you all love from Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to give you a future with hope. The people of Judah had lost their city, they lost their temple, lost their way of life, their football team was 0-7. Oh 
And yet, just when it seemed like things were at their worst, the Lord did something extraordinary in their midst. In the midst of failure and desolation, God casts a vision for the people of Judah. A vision of restoration and hope. And this extraordinary vision from the Lord comes through an equally extraordinary conduit. Not a prophet, not even one of God's own people, but through, get this, a Persian king. Because the story of Ezra begins like this. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia. Who? Cyrus. Is that, is that like Jeremiah's great-great-grandson? No. He is the king of Persia. He isn't a Jew. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and also put it in writing. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. I want us to stop for just a minute here and realize how ridiculous this sounds. God made a non-believing, antagonistic ruler his personal mouthpiece to get a message across to God's people. God uses Israel's oppressor, their enemy, to cast a vision of liberation. It was God entering into the midst of a broken, failed situation and breathing hope and life into it. And folks, this is the piece we shouldn't lose sight of. Even though the circumstances were bad. Even though this story would end in a bad place. The vision that God had delivered to his people was good. It was hopeful. I want to be bold in saying I believe that God has a vision for Tremont United Methodist Church. Do you believe it? Do you? Do you believe it? I believe God has a vision for this church. I believe it's a good vision. I believe it's a hopeful vision. I believe it is a Christ-centered vision. The question for us today is how do we engage it? How do we engage God's vision for us during challenging times? How do we take hold of what God has for us when we're facing an uncertain future? How do we do all of that without the fear of failure. And that's what we're after today. Today, we'll try to learn how to engage what God has for us. Now, let me tell you what we don't know about God's vision that was given to Cyrus. We have no idea how it was delivered to him. We have no idea how this Persian king ended up with this vision from God. Zero clue about why a Middle Eastern imperial ruler in his first year as king made a sweeping change to foreign policy that resulted in the end of the Jewish exile. We don't know how it happened. We don't know if God showed up. We don't know if he sent an angel. We don't know if he spoke to him through a dream. All we know is that God had a vision and the person who received it was the king of Persia. If we were on a football field, you'd think that message got intercepted and got run back for six points. How is it that God spoke through a Persian king, an enemy of Judah? Well, there are several prominent theories on how this happened. The Jewish historian Josephus believed that Cyrus had been shown portions of Isaiah 44, which prophesied that a Persian king named Cyrus would liberate the Hebrew people. And Josephus believed that Cyrus must have found this prophecy, read it, and then moved quickly to put it into action. In other words, he heard the word of the Lord and he chose in his heart to believe in it. That's possible. Some scholars think that the prophet Daniel may have had something to do with it. You may remember Daniel, Daniel in the lion's den. Daniel had been a highly regarded governor in the Babylonian Empire, and some speculated that when Babylon fell, Cyrus and his administration saw the promise of this young, influential leader, and he turned to Daniel, and Daniel said, You know, we have a prophecy about you. And some have speculated that Daniel may have influenced Cyrus to let his people return to their homeland. Personally, I'm not concerned about speculation. I don't care so much about the how. What I want to know, like many of you, is why. Why did God's vision come in this way? Why Cyrus? Why not one of God's own people? 
And the answer may be as simple as this, folks. It's possible that Cyrus simply had a heart that was ready to receive the word of the Lord. We don't know how the God of Israel fit into Cyrus's personal belief system, but extra-biblical sources have given us clues. We know that there's an artifact out there called the Cyrus Cylinder, and we know from that cylinder that Cyrus was a polytheist. He, he believed in many gods. So for him, the God of Israel was not the almighty God. He was a regional God, one among many, who had limited power, limited authority. So no, Cyrus was not a closeted Jew who secretly worshipped the Lord. His theology was not orthodox by any stretch of the imagination. And yet, folks, we still have to deal with the fact that God spoke to Cyrus. And we don't know why. Maybe it was that the ears of the Hebrew people were closed to God's voice. Maybe Cyrus was simply sympathetic to their plight. One thing is clear about Cyrus. He was a man with an inquiring mind. Persian rulers tended to rely on prophecy when making decisions. Most Persian kings would have been surrounded by a court of astrologers, people who looked at the positioning of the stars to determine the will of the gods, and they would shape their policies around the position of these stars. And even though their methods and their theology may have been imperfect, it may be that God worked through those flaws to deliver a very real, very timely message. By the way, we have a clear example of this happening in the New Testament. In Matthew's Gospel, when a group of Persian astrologers called Magi followed a star to find the Christ child in Bethlehem. My point is simply this, folks. For those who are asking, for those who are seeking God's will, even in imperfect ways, God provides a way to make his vision known. But folks, listen, I think we have to ask for it. As a church, I think all of us want to know what God has in store for our future. But are we asking for it? Have we inquired of God? Have we turned our lives fully toward Him in humility and asked, Lord, what is your will for this church? Jesus, what is your desire for the village of Tremont? What do you want to do in this place at this time with these people, my brothers and sisters? Folks, are we asking those questions? Because those are the questions I believe that God loves to answer. And the real benefit of us asking questions is that asking questions helps us to develop soft hearts. Do you all know someone in your life who's soft-hearted, tender-hearted? Don't you love spending time with that person? We don't know much about Cyrus as a person, but, but there's a clue that tells us God was working in his life in a significant way. Verse 1 tells us something about Cyrus's heart. Verse 1 says that Cyrus's heart was movable. It says that God moved his heart which means that Cyrus must have had a soft heart. Have you ever had a conversation with a hard-hearted person before? Those aren't fun conversations, are they? You know, I've noticed, and maybe you have too, that hard-hearted people rarely ask questions. Instead, they tend to make a lot of declarative statements, right? Right? And, and I think it makes a lot of sense because asking questions requires some humility, doesn't it? A, a question acknowledges that you don't have all the information. A question means being vulnerable. A question comes from a soft, movable heart. Church, if we're looking to engage God's vision, I think it begins simply with us developing a softness in our hearts. God can't plant a seed in soil that hasn't been tilled. And maybe prayer is our opportunity to invite the Spirit of God to soften up our hearts 
to receive what God has for us. I don't know, but what would it look like if we had a dedicated group of people who met every single week for the sole purpose of praying for God to guide and to direct this church? What do you think that kind of prayer would unlock here at TUMC? I can't help but think that if we had 15 to 20 people every week who were desperately seeking God's face, that God would open up the floodgates of heaven and pour His Spirit out on this church and on this community. Boy, I think God has a great vision for this church. And if we ask Him with soft hearts, I think He'd share it with us, don't you? Soft hearts receive great visions. And once you've received a vision, you can begin to articulate what it means. And this is what Cyrus does. After hearing from the Lord, Cyrus doesn't just hear the vision and keep it to himself, but instead he articulates God's vision. He shares it and he explains what it will mean for the people of Judah. This is what he says. Any of the Lord's people among you may go up to Jerusalem in Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem, and may their God be with them. And then he gets a little more specific. And in any locality where survivors may now be living, the people are to provide them with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. Cyrus does something really straightforward, but incredibly simple and important. He puts God's vision into context. Every vision needs a context, folks. A vision tells us what God wants. A context tells us how to put the vision into action. Jesus commands us to feed the hungry. Well, what does that mean in Tremont? It might mean providing actual meals. It might also mean addressing spiritual starvation, people who are desperate to hear the word of God. Jesus ate with tax collectors and sinners. Well, who are the tax collectors and who are the sinners in this community? How are we being called to reach out to them uniquely? How about this one? Jesus commissioned us to go into all the world to make disciples, to teach them, and to baptize them. Guys, there are a lot of different ways that we can do that. But how are we being uniquely called to do that here in Tremont? God gave the vision. Cyrus gave it context. Here's what's exciting about this church. God has a distinct vision for us. Every local church shares a common call. We are united by one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one Father. But our context means that we will live out that call in a unique way. And my point is this, folks. We need to pray for God to send us the vision, and then we need to articulate what it means in our context. Soft hearts to receive the vision and then a willingness to articulate what it means. Folks, I believe that God has good things in mind for this church. Do you all believe that? Do you believe that our good God, who created all of these good people, who planted this good church and established it on the strong foundation of Jesus Christ, do you think he has a good vision in mind for you all? I bet he does. This is a good church, and it's filled with good people, people who want to serve the Lord. You have hearts that that yearn to hear from God, and I know that because I hear it in the way that you talk about your hopes, the way you talk about your dreams. And so today, I'm simply asking you, would you dream with me? Would you begin each day this week by asking God to move your heart? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Would you begin each day this week asking God to move your heart? Ask Him to soften the soil so that His dreams can be planted in you. Would you do that with me? And then each night before bed, ask God to show you how to put those dreams into context. Ask God, what does this mean for this church in this season? What does this mean for Tremont? What does this mean for this county? What does it mean for central Illinois? What does it mean in 2023? What does it mean in 2024? God, would you show us? 
I believe that if you'll do those two things, to ask God to soften your heart, and Lord, to give us that dream and to contextualize it, I believe he'll do amazing things through us. Would you pray with me now? Lord, you are good. You're a wonderful God. You have equipped this church with wonderful people. And as we walk through this series with our eyes firmly fixed on Jesus, Lord, we ask that you would soften our hearts each morning to prepare us as soil ready for a seed to be planted. Lord, have us be filled with your Spirit so that we can understand what it is you are calling us to do and be in this season. Lord, we pray, give us your vision. And then, Lord, each night this week, before we go to bed, Lord, help us to articulate what that vision would mean. Help us to put it into action. Help us to develop an excitement around how you're going to change people's lives, how you're going to make disciples and transform the world through us. And Lord, we know we won't do that perfectly. We know there will even be failure. But we're also reminded of what Jesus said, that the gates of hell will not prevail against your church. We are a victorious church because we serve a victorious Christ. Lord, would you lead us onward? Help us to dream your dreams and to articulate them and grow more and more to trust in you each and every day. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Would you stand with me as we sing our final hymn, Trust and Obey. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. While we do His good will, He abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toil is does richly repay not a grief for a loss not a frown or a cross but is blessed if we trust and obey trust and obey for there's no other to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. But we never can prove the delights of His love until all on the altar we lay for the favor for the joy he bestows are for them who will trust and obey trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey 
that in fellowship sweet we will sit at his feet or we'll walk by his side in the way what he says we will do where he sends we will go never fear only trust and obey trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. It all starts with vision. It all starts with the vision that God has for us. Next week we're going to be looking at how you fit into it. Because each of you have a calling. Every single one of you are called into ministry. And next week we're going to look at what that means for you. So I hope that you're ready to be empowered to be energized by that because I believe that God has a great future in store for TUMC. Go forth in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Not in failure, but in hope. Hope in Jesus. Amen.